The wedding bells toll in a fine crisp morning. The crimson-haired bride, Edith Regelhoff, in all her glory and unparalleled beauty, scorned and envied by the ladies, lusted by men, marched the aisle. Nobody would guess that inside her, a different soul resides. A normal, black-haired, overworked salary lady, swamped with debts, and constantly exploited by her compulsive gambler older brother, her life was a living hell. A life that ended tragically when her older brother, out of anger, pushed her down the stairs. She woke up in an unfamiliar setting. The moment the stone-faced maid called her name, she realized that she's been transmigrated to the world of the novel she read overnight, letting go of the obsession. The protagonist is a bright, pure, and beautiful girl, with long, silky, blonde hair and blue eyes, akin to the goddess of spring. The Baron's illegitimate daughter, Rees Sinclair. Because she was low-born, the family persecuted her and had an unhappy childhood. She caught the eye of the Duke and Duchess of Rudwick and was taken to live as a lady of their household. The obsession in the title of the novel pertains to the rivalry between the sons of the ducal household who were vying for Rees's affection, which leave no room for compromise. But, alas, she is not that character. Rather, the role she was given is the main antagonist of the story, a foolish, greedy, addle-minded villainess, someone who is always effortlessly taken care of, for the sake of the heroine's happiness. Prior to her marriage, she already knew the flow of the story, and she hoped to somewhat make Edith's life easier. However, there were events that were never mentioned in the novel. Seeing her father, Duke Regelholf, triggered the memory sink. She saw the physical and verbal abuse Edith experienced on the hands of her own father, brother, and even the maids and servants. Going even a bit further back, Count Rudwick and Count Regelholf were equals in terms of rank, but recent events granted Count Rudwick the title of Duke after he brought great achievements from battle. Count Regelholf, a sore loser, believes that the ducal title was stolen from him, so in order to get even, he'll push Edith's, his own daughter, to marry one of the Rudwick's sons, he'll use her to infiltrate the ducal house of his rival to discover a way to bring them down. What they don't know, the soul inside Edith is someone who has a knack for finding ways to survive in harsh situations. Her first agenda, not to act the way the original Edith did. Arriving at the duchy, her father and older brother are belittling the family. She let them blab away as she enjoys the impressive garden of the Rudwicks. Prior to dinner, Edith feasted her eyes on the characters she just imagined based on the author's description. Seeing them in person is eye candy for her. The kind-looking but graceful Duchess Jocelyn Rudwick and the imposing Duke Axel Rudwick. Their son, Cliff, the handsome male lead with black hair and golden eyes that makes a girl's knees weak. Sitting beside him is Rees the main protagonist of the story with breathtaking beauty. Looking at the man sitting beside the heroine, Killian Rudwick, the man she is bound to marry, sent shivers down her spine. The man had a sharp, straight nose and a defined jawline, a tapered physique consisting of a broad chest, a slender waist, and muscular thighs. Notice sipping the man's sidelong glance made her realize she's been gawking at him. She immediately snapped out of it. Dinner was superb, and she enjoyed it with much gusto. As she predicted, based on the novel, her father started to push forward the marriage talks and insisted on sending a maid from their household to be her personal attendant, despite the uncomfortable air emanating from her future in-laws. When the Duchess voiced out that their maids at the duchy is inferior to no one, her father, Count Regelholf, rudely inquired if the Duchess did not bring her own maids when she married into the Rudwicks. Sensing the looming hostility, she finally intervened by telling her father that she's fine. She then excused her father's outburst as plain worry over a daughter's incompetence, since she would be living in an unfamiliar household. Her father was, as expected, enraged by her intervention. But she explained that to remove any suspicion, she must enter the duchy as a bride, alone. After some time, she'll fake her sickness and make excuses that she longs for home. That would be an apt excuse to summon maids from their house. With careful planning, her objective of escaping her family's clutches is finally coming into fruition. Going back to the wedding, which reached the exchange of rings, she felt a sense of relief. 
But no, after her husband gingerly put the ring on her finger, obviously showing his averseness to touching her, he put his own ring himself. Not wanting to make a scene, and to ease the offense she felt, she turned to the ring bearers and warmly thanked them, ignoring the sarcastic laughter that flooded the church upon witnessing what the groom did. Nightfall. Finally, she got free of the killer heels and wedding dress with bodice that was a little too tight on the chest. She was brushing her hair when there came a knock on the door. The next chapter of the story is starting as she expected. In the original scene, Rees, wearing the same white dress she wore during the wedding, would come in and apologize in behalf of Killian's rudeness. Edith, taking it as an insult would lash out at Rees, making her relationship with the Rudwicks plummet. Seeing Rees in her bedroom, the soul possessing Edith's body agreed that the lady has every reason to get angry. Nobody is supposed to wear white at a wedding, except the bride, but she's not the actual Edith, so she'll let it pass. Instead of resenting her husband, she praised Reese's appearance, which made the blonde girl blush in return. They were having a cozy moment when the maid called for bath. Edith was enjoying her warm soak in the bathtub when there came a knock on the door, immediately followed by footsteps. It was Killian, still wearing his wedding suit. Caught with no time to prepare herself, she remained inside the tub, hoping that the water can cover her nudity from his eyes. Accusing her of being a cruel bride for going ahead with her bath without waiting for her groom, she calmly reminded him that his actions at the abbey obviously showed abhorrence. Annoyed by her indifference, Killian left her alone. Fuming, he treaded the vast hall of their duchy and saw Rees. The girl good-naturedly inquired about him and his wife, and when he started to show dislike for her, she got angry on her behalf. Clearly, Rees has no clue whatever he was feeling that time. It is cruel to hear the lady you like ship you to someone else. Killian was about to voice out his feelings when Cliff emerged from the shadows. Rees's eyes immediately shone as soon as she saw his brother. He was left there watching them. Edith woke up good-humoredly and commended the young body she has for enduring it well, despite the ordeal she faced at yesterday's wedding. With a light heart, she thought of a dress that is best suited to face her in-laws to give her morning greetings. Ringing for a maid, whose name she learned as Anna, she discovered that all the dress she brought were inappropriately designed to be revealing. Not wanting to displease her in-laws, she requested Anna to make adjustments to one of her dresses. She asked her to remove the unnecessary ornaments and attach something on the chest area to make it a bit modest. Waiting for the maid to come back, she pondered if she should scatter rose petals on the marital bed. As per custom, she backed out at the thought. In the original story, Killian swore to keep his purity for Rees. She decided to respect that. However, she failed to stop herself from having lustful thoughts about her husband's chest as the maid fixed her hair. She admonished herself and mentally uttered her name, Choi Suna. She already swore not to fall in love with Killian. Facing her in-laws was like sitting on a couch full of nails. Being aware of her duties with managing financial transactions and arranging the documents, as the wife of a noble household, gave the Duke a chance to doubt her even more. Over morning tea, he maliciously hinted that he is aware that there's a high chance that she might steal important documents from the duchy to favor her father. Instead of being angry, she humbled herself and suggested to the duke that if her training is somewhat lacking, he can appoint another role to her. The duchess intervened and told her that she'll be glad to have her, and if possible, she would like Edith to help her in two weeks' time. Their meeting ended with her touring the estate by the duke's aide, Viscount Linen Filch a bespectacled man with long, honey-gold hair and green eyes. In the novel, Linen and Anna were not mentioned, thus making her a bit nervous interacting with them. He was blunt, but not disrespectful. Their first destination was the jewelry exhibition room, where important jewels of the duchy are kept. As a wife of the household, she is allowed to use them during special events. Next was the weaponry room, where the maintenance and safekeeping of the duchy's armory, which are crafted by renowned artists, are done. It is often used by the duke and his sons. Their next destination were the library and Sistine, where books and artworks were kept respectively. Since the duchy was vast, 
Linen cut their tour short and scheduled another tour for tomorrow. Edith was grateful and thanked him sincerely, much to Linen's surprise. Taking her back, they passed by the Hall of Contests. It overlooks the vastness of the Duchy's courtyard, where a luxurious gazebo stands. Incidentally, the gazebo was occupied. Rees, Cliff, and Killian were having tea. They seemed to be having a wonderful time. Linen seemed concerned for Edith, who wouldn't be enraged to see her own husband having tea time with another woman. Contrary to his worry, Edith just coolly commented on the beauty of the surroundings and that she's looking forward to spring. To the Edith, who is actually Choi Suna, it really doesn't matter. Later that day, Linen reported to his master, the Duke, the events of the tour. The lady displayed a dignified attitude, contrary to rumors. That night, after having dinner on her own, Choi Suna, who is inside Edith's body, contemplated over the events of the novel. So far, looking back at Reese's experiences and how the novel world centered around her, their fates are different. Her life is a living tragedy. She was bullied by her seniors at work, betrayed by her boyfriend, and was exploited by her sibling. She wondered what her brother did after she died. Were her parents sad with her passing? Deciding to love herself more as Edith, she looked out the window and witnessed a picturesque meeting between Rees and her husband Killian. In the original story, Killian never won over Cliff for Rees's affection. She left the window upon hearing Killian's cold-hearted disregard of her significance in the Rudwick's household. She was expecting it after all. Meanwhile, in the Sinclair County, Layla, youngest daughter of the family, was enraged at the news that the new bride of the duchy was Edith Regalholf. But her brother's nonchalant attitude about the news somewhat made her calm down. There's nothing to worry even if the merger between the Duke, known for their superb armory, and Count Regalholf, who owns the mines for the ore used for the production of aforementioned craft, came to fruition. The two factions vying for each of their chosen candidate for the seat remains unchanged. Duke Rudwick supports the Emperor. Count Regalholf supports the rebellious forces with Archduke Langston. Even if the Regalholf's daughter was married into the duchy, the Count is not someone who can be put on a leash. After all, he is the one who makes the controlling. Damien Sinclair, the eldest of the family, personally witnessed how Count Regalholf physically assault his daughter, Edith for failing her task of extracting information on the bridge construction from Earl Everton. She was begging for mercy to her father, as she was threatened to starve for a week. One fine morning at the duchy, the duchess started to let Edith help with document work. Midst the workload in front of them, the duchess suddenly stood up and answered the knock on the door of the salon they are using as office. When Edith asked what it was all about, Rees, who was sitting beside her, explained that the Duchess invited the royal designer. She immediately remembered the chapter from the novel. Edith will make an effort to choose for the Duchess, but somehow the choice of Rees, being the protagonist of the story, will be chosen. Edith will leave in a fit of anger. Deciding to act differently from the Edith of the novel, she decided to stay quiet and let things unfold. She doesn't have a morsel of an idea how dresses are chosen in that world. And second, no matter what she does, it'll be Reese's choice that will reign supreme. However, even after Reese gave her idea of a dress for the Duchess, her opinion was still asked. Not wanting to appear stubborn, Edith chose a luxuriously elegant dress with a fresh take and something that will complement the Duchess' eyes. The Duchess was happy with their choices that she decided to take both dresses. Turning to Reese's wardrobe, the Duchess started to make suggestions. Since the current Edith is fond of her, she also made suggestions that the Duchess approved of. They got so immersed with making choices that they ended up with five dresses for Reese. As the designer was leaving, the Duchess offered Edith to choose some for herself, but she politely declined. Instead, she called for Anna, her maid, to bring her dresses and asked the designer to alter it for her. Feeling good with her performance, Edith headed to her quarters after saying her goodbyes to the Duchess and Rees. As she treaded the hall with a smile on her face, she was surprised to find Killian by her bedroom door. Rees was inviting her for afternoon tea at the gazebo. As they walk away from her room, she rummaged her brain if such an event occurred in the novel, not recalling any. 
she decided to let it unfold and act accordingly. With her mind not preoccupied and her husband walking in front of her, she can't help but gawk at his impressively sexy physique. He's really toned skin to a professional swimmer. Killian must have sensed her stare and abruptly turned to face her. But no, he didn't admonish her for gawking, but rudely reminded her to conduct herself carefully in front of Reese. He also slammed it into her face that Reese is way more important to him than a vulgar woman such as herself. Genuinely hurt by his words, she pointed it out that she's human too but he carelessly called her a snake. Exasperated by his behavior, she threateningly warned if she should treat Rees the way he is politely treating her. But she didn't. Rees is a totally different matter. During tea time, she kept quiet and just listened to the three of them exchange their usual friendly banter. But Cliff just won't let the opportunity pass to test her. Killian outright rejected the idea of inspecting the borderlands and pointed it out to Cliff as his duty being the Duke's appointed heir. Cliff then asked Edith's opinion about Killian, Rees and her being left to their own devices while he is away obviously hinting the undeniable attraction Killian has for Rees. Taking the safe route, Edith answered that it is not in her position to ask Cliff not to go, it'll be presumptuous of her to suggest he brings Rees with her considering they are not blood-related, neither a married couple. Edith caught a sly look crossing Rees's eyes upon hearing her reply, as she herself showed an innocent face and begged Cliff not to go. Such look on her face is out of character. Edith reasoned it out as her eyes are just playing tricks. That evening, Killian decided to enjoy the night air as he contemplates on his wife's actions. Even if she was openly provoked by Cliff, she chose to be civil and avoided getting angry. His reverie came to a halt when the door of the terrace opened, revealing Rees, talking to her about their dress purchase that afternoon, made him privy to his wife's actions. She didn't buy clothes for herself. Taking it negatively, he interpreted it as her not liking the designer and looking down on their duchy's take on clothes. Despite Reese's defense on Edith's behalf, Killian's hatred for his wife did not abate. He dislikes the disturbing feelings she evoked within him whenever he saw her exposed, but he has to admit, albeit begrudgingly, that her modest clothes are making him feel a bit at ease as of late. However, his pride as son of the duchy can't let her recent actions pass, he swore to find a designer that can cater to her taste in clothes. Meanwhile, at Edith's quarters, Anna reported that her perfume is almost gone. Not really knowing how Noble's financial needs are managed, the reincarnated Edith took into consideration her own money, which is a limited resource and putting up a front to maintain her pride as a noble, the latter one, and Anna summoned a perfume artisan the next day. That morning, she experienced culture shock with the price of things. Despite her haggling, she was only able to buy three things with the astronomical sum she spent. She's worried she might forget her sense of money with the way things are priced inside the novel. Still, she consoled herself that there are things that money can't buy. Following that train of thought, she remembered the Sistine and bade Anna, her maid, a brief farewell. Rushing to the Sistine, her eyes fell on an impressive painting of a knight. The artist was able to depict the feeling of suffering, despair, and urgency of the moment, despite its victorious theme. Feeling a rush of awe, she unconsciously slipped down the floor on a sitting position, hugging her knees. A sarcastic voice broke her trance. It was Killian. They exchanged banter, which ended up with Killian walking away, much to her amusement. The next day, before she went on duty to help the Duchess with organizing the documents, she went on her usual routine. Crossing paths with Linen, she gave him a brief morning greeting and went on her way. Linen and Anna are the only two people who treat her with kindness. Secretly, she watches her husband and her brother spar, obviously trying to impress Rees, who is watching them. That day, she introduced to the Duchess the table format of organizing data, contrary to Rees's reaction. The Duchess was pleased and even commended her for making it easier for viewing the data. They were both deeply immersed in the subject of the table format, that they failed to see the Reese's face filled with shadow. Later that day, the Duchess showed Killian the innovation Edith made. 
Even if he doesn't want to praise her, he admitted that it was impressive. Reese, who was a spectator at such exchange, didn't let the opportunity pass to show her inferiority complex and voiced it out to Killian when he asked for her opinion regarding Edith's recent job. Being biased, as usual, Killian denied Edith's skill and excused her achievement as something she's been trained to do as part of the plot to leak information to her father. Resentment filled his very being, and without considering his mother's plea to be a little kinder to his wife, who was trapped in the political marriage just as he is, he stormed her room. Not knowing why Killian suddenly visited her on a midday, Edith tried to tease Killian, but it ended up badly. Her husband accused her of belittling the family's taste in clothes, even though her only purpose in not buying dresses for herself was to alter her personality. It exasperated her to no end, that all he sees in her is a lecherous and pretentious snake that he made himself to believe she actually was. Frustration made her face him and spat it to his face that he knows not a thing about her. Not wanting to lose to her, even if her outburst shaken him, he accused her of being in cahoots with her father when he forced their marriage. Her resigned expression surprised him, looking at him as if she can't do anything if that's how he sees her. She once again reiterated, in a calmer tone, devoid of any emotion, that he doesn't know anything about her. It was almost unbearable for Killian to watch her looking like that. Masking his true emotions, he left his wife a harsh warning not to do anything suspicious. Alone in her room, Edith despairingly wondered why despite her efforts to divert from the usual Edith, people still view her as someone who is evil. Despair made her plan of a way to escape the luxurious life at the duchy and let go of all hopes of being happy. Leaving his wife's room made him think of the cruel things he told her. Indeed, she's right. Not a thing that's not connected to Count Regalholf can be considered he know of his wife. Thinking back, whether it's the way she looks or the rose scent of her room, his thinking got a bit jumbled whenever he sees her. His headache seemed to be occurring quite frequently, as of late. All of his musings flew away as soon as Reese reached his side. True enough, she is his salvation. Compared to his wife's presence, he would always welcome hers. Meanwhile, Edith rang for her maid. She requested for preparations to out. Living as a salary woman, she used to go out and have a glass of iced coffee while walking aimlessly. Planning to do just that, to ease her sadness, she went out with her maid. First order of destination was jewelry shop, where she sold all of the jewel ornaments removed from her gaudy clothes she sent for alterations. Next was a bank. Last was a nearby calf where she and Anna enjoyed a scrumptious meal. The places they went to were all from Anna's suggestion, based on the inquiries she directed at her maid. As they enjoyed the meal they ordered, she subtly asked her maid how do commoners travel, considering they don't have carriage of their own. It was in preparation for when her husband finally abandons her and kick her from the duchy. What Anna told her was almost similar to how people from her world commute. They rent carriages or ride in bulk in a makeshift train wagon. Unsure of her maid's loyalty, she stopped her inquiries for that day. She might be reporting everything about her to the Duke. She can't afford to let them get an inkling of her plans. After the outing, she immersed herself with self-study. At present, she was studying the method of identifying the old to fresh soybeans, as she comically asked herself if she can really live a farmer's life should she leave the duchy. She was contemplating the life she would pursue when Anna knocked on the door of the library, telling her that the Duchess has summoned for her because the jeweler has arrived. Hearing about the jeweler triggered a memory from the novel. It must be the day where, in the original story, Edith was humiliated. As usual, the family was getting a gaga with Rees and were busy choosing jewelry for her. Rees, feeling sorry for Edith who's being ignored, will suggest a simple necklace that resembles the color of Edith's hair. The latter would take offense and shall demand all of the jewels laid before her, except the one suggested by Rees. The outcome would be Cliff buying everything for Rees, issuing a blank check to the jeweler, he bought everything for Rees, except the necklace that was meant for Edith. Expecting such an outcome, Edith came to the salon. Quietly, she watched the family fuss over Rees's jewelry set. However, one significant change was there. Killian was not joining the fuss. Instead, he told Rees to chose one she likes the best. They'll surely agree to it. Rees, 
Flustered with the suggestion turned to Edith and suggested a simple necklace, something delicately crafted with a ruby pendant and necklace embedded with bezel gems. Edith genuinely liked the item and was reaching for it when another hand grabbed the necklace. It was Killian. He instructed her to turn around and went ahead with putting on the necklace for her. Surprised though she was at his gesture, she immediately interpreted it as his way of showing his mother that they are in good terms. They can't let the Duchess be worried for them all the time. Killian got teasing praises from his family. Cliff, on the other hand, declared he'll buy all the collection for Rees. The Duchess protested on Edith's behalf, but she said that the necklace is good enough for her. That night, happy that for the first time she received jewelry that she's unwilling to sell, Edith read her letters. Among them was a letter from her father reminding her of the real reason why she was married into the Rudwicks, and demanding that she send over the documents they needed to topple the Duke's family. For some reason, her father become privy to the fact that she's helping with the Duchess. She suspected there's a spy among the servants. Not wanting to make her father suspicious, she immediately composed a letter. In it, she told her father how formidable the weaponry of the Duke is, and that the crafting of the weaponry was the directive of Eve Emperor himself. Considering that the current empire's power is stable, it will be more beneficial for their family not to side with the rebellion and just maintain the peace and support the current empire. Feeling confident, she never would have guessed the next turn of events. Called into the Duke's office, with Killian and Cliff, and Linen as well, she was being accused of leaking information to her father, Count Regalholf. Said document was a fake document bearing fake information about the Duke's weaponry and materials for crafting armory, it was also meant for her only. Thus, when her father started purchasing such items which were fabricated and were exclusively written in the fake document handed to her to work on, it was strong evidence that it was she who leaked them. Edith pointed out that she's not the only one who was privy to such document. There was its author and the servant who handled the document. However, the Duke contested that the author of said document was Linen, and the only people who were working with her inside the room were the Duchess and Rees. Is she saying that one of his family leaked the information? Once again, she was asked if she did it, and she stood her ground saying no. Noticing that she was never addressed in her official name, Edith Rudwick, she mocked the Duke and asked if Rees was a Rudwick as well. Rage filled the Duke's face at the direct attack of their beloved Rees. He warned Edith to be careful of what she's saying. Truth be told, Edith does not believe that it was Linen. Although she's hurt that he lied to her about the authenticity of the documents he handed her. She doesn't suspect Rees either. She believes that she can't do such a devious thing. The only possibility is that there is a spy among the servants. But if there really is, does marrying her off into the Rudwicks really necessary? Not meaning to, she remembered the past events of the novel that continued to happen even if she changed the course of things. Just like the current situation, Edith can't avoid the tragedy. Feeling helpless, she noticed that tears have been flowing from her eyes. Abruptly wiping them, she composed herself and faced the Duke as she righted her sitting posture. Rage and self-pity made her challenge the Duke. If he truly believes that she did it, without any morsel of doubt, he can behead her. Shocked filled the room. Cliff intervened and asked the Duke to investigate the case. In the meantime, Edith is to be confined to her room guarded by linen. But before they can even finish the appointment, Killian intervened and dragged his wife to her chambers. He sternly reprimanded her for impulsively challenging his father. The Duke is known as sudden guillotine in the battlefield. She sarcastically told her husband that doesn't matter anymore. No one would believe her anyway. Just as they find a way to incriminate her, they will find ways to prove that she did it. Why should she wait that long to be executed? He won't even be bothered if she died anyway. Much to her surprise, Killian swore on his family's honor that he will investigate the incident without bias. Resignedly, she told him that she finds it hard to believe his words. The only other possible suspects were the Duchess, his own mother, and Rees. Said Rees is with Cliff and Linen. After Killian emotionally declined an invitation to visit the Imperial Palace with them, 
reasoning that he still needs to investigate the current incident at their ducal household. Alighting the carriage, they were welcomed by Princess Catherine Iberia, the only blood relative of the current emperor. She's boyish, wears equestrian pants, cut her hair short despite being royal, and doesn't care for politics. Cliff is her crush, and she's fond of Reese despite the latter snatching the only guy she ever liked. Her impression of Edith's personality is as low as the gutter. She abhors the Regalholfs and the Langstons. Choi Su Na, who's inside Edith's body, is currently dreaming. She was once hospitalized and made a friend. They were both waiting for their bone marrow transplant. Her brother was reluctant to donate for her, despite theirs being a match, while her friend, currently bald due to treatments, was yet to find a match. Despite the direness of her situation, her bald friend was hopeful. She still dreamt of growing up, wearing lipstick, and walking the streets to see how people actually live their lives. She had her bone marrow transplant and recovered, leaving the hospital without saying goodbye to her friend who was left behind. Whenever Choi Su Na felt helpless, she would often dream of that memory from when she was hospitalized. When she woke up, as Edith, a new determination filled her being, she can't give up just yet. Such determination is being tested, first thing in the morning. 